Um, well, welcome everybody. It's nice to get to speak to you. Um, I was supposed to come last spring, and I had, I had to cancel very set the last second. So, I, if you came or you wanted to come, then I, I want to just apologize again for that. I had a violently ill child, um, so I was uh, stuck at home. I would have rather been here, honestly. So, anyway, um, it's fun to get to come and see. Um, I've, I've worked hard with the VPRI office on the cluster, so I, at, I have on one hat of like it's really. This is great. Uh, wow, you guys look fantastically well organized and exciting group and a great interdisciplinary group. Um, so now I'll take that head off and I'll go back to just being a, a plain old researcher. And um, Lisa asked me to tell you a little bit about the work in my lab. Um, and so I thought what I would do is I'll kind of frame the problem that we're trying to understand and then move into some of the ways that we're um, addressing the problem. So I have. Um, kind of three major lines of research are around stroke rehabilitation in my lab, and I'll be able to share two of the three of those somewhat briefly with you today. Um, I guess I also want to invite questions as we go. I understand it's, it's a very, you're a very diverse audience, and uh, I might slip into um, jargon or and or there might just be something you're interested in, and you want me to stop and explain more, or um, you have an idea around it. So please feel free to interrupt me. There's no need to, to wait. Um, despite the fact that we're a big group. So um, I have no conflict, just my obligatory slide there. Everything's publicly funded. Um, I really need to get a conflict, because um, that would be exciting and fun, but I don't have one today, so. Okay, so I'll do these three things, and the, the big one is to talk about our kind of challenge, and that is um, this idea that we now understand the human brain to be really magnificently neuroplastic, um, in that Really, all the behaviors that we engage in in our daily lives are shaping our brains, changing our brains, changing them for the better and for the worse. And what we try to do in my lab is then understand how, where does that fail after the brain is hurt, so after it's hurt by a stroke, um, and what can we do to mitigate that? So are there ways that we can overcome the barriers that we have for neuroplasticity after brain damage? So I'll talk about that first. Um, I want to talk about a little bit of the work we're doing uh, using some different robotic interventions um, and some ideas we have around that. And those are um, largely collaborations I have with the group at Simon Fraser uh, University. And then um, I'll talk most about some of our non-invasive brain simulation work where we're trying to actually interact with the brain, um, both to map it and as a therapeutic. So. So stroke. Um, my best advice around stroke is don't have one. Um, it is the leading cause of adult disability in the world and in Canada. And what's very interesting about stroke, um, as long as you don't have one, this is interesting, is that we don't die from stroke anymore. So 83% of Canadians will survive their stroke. And that's because of these amazing advances we've had in acute medical management. So we have drugs that can mitigate a clot, so basically just all back up even farther. So a stroke is, it's basically plumbing. You either, uh, you have vessels in your brain delivering blood, and the most common way to have a stroke is for one of those vessels to become blocked. And usually blocked by um, some type of fatty deposit that's built up on the inside linings of your vessels. Your blood vessels over the years, one of those breaks loose and it flows along in your blood until it gets to a pipe that's too small. And uh, you have a rapid, loss of brain cells as a result of the ensuing loss of blood to that area. So the loss of blood cells is fairly tremendous. You lose about 1.9 neurons per minute in a stroke, and that can uh, translate into about three years of aging. So it's, it's very rapid, it's very significant. So we have some new methods that we can use to keep people alive after stroke so that these don't grow and become so disabling. Uh, clots can be mechanically extracted. Uh, clots can be broken up with uh, uh, blood thinners. However, you can see that from the statistics I just told you, you're losing you know, almost two million neurons a minute. Even waiting an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, you have very significant damage to the brain. So we're gonna keep you alive after your stroke. That's the good news. The bad news is we don't really have any good therapies to help restore your function after we've kept you alive. So stroke is now a chronic disease in Canada and a disease that we are working very hard with many other groups to try to think about how do we help that damaged brain repair itself? Um, how do we help it compensate for the lost neurons and the lost axons as a result of that damage? Um, and one of the kind of um, things that really highlights the shift in medical care is not just that we're keeping people alive, but that um, people's quality of life as they live in the community with stroke is actually showing clinically meaningful declines. 
And so we've seen this statistically. We get these old snapshots of uh, population-based data. Um, and this is one that's a little bit old, but it is very um, striking that in a country like Canada that over a seven-year period, people's quality of life would get worse. And that's what these data are showing us. So we studied learning in my lab as a surrogate for rehabilitation. It's uh, kind of a little trick we play. So we figure if you could learn one of the crazy lab tasks we think of, you could also probably learn something uh, when you're in therapy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how is it experienced by mm -hmm. the Yeah, um, I'm happy to. So this is a, this is a survey that um, is done every seven years as a relationship with health-related quality of life. And the two indices in this particular survey that came out here and are, we're just about to show it again, unfortunately, is that people's quality of life is declining um, owing to uh, poor cognition. That's their number one complaint. And the second complaint is poor arm motor function. And then if you look down the list, the next one is pain. And so those are the three things that we clearly are not managing well. That This is community-based quality of life. So these people who have finished their medical care, they've done their rehabilitation stay, and they're, they're into whatever environment they're going this into. Is per capita, so independent of the number of strokes. Independent of the number of strokes, yeah. Um, if we want to drill into it a little bit more, these declines and the, the um, disability and the life disruption that's experienced after stroke are significantly worse in women. So women, um, firstly, uh, wait longer to go to the hospital, so they have more severe strokes. They wait on average seven hours, where men only wait four. And so you see almost a doubling of stroke severity. Women are, uh, have, for whatever reason, are less likely offered, to be offered the acute medical interventions that I described. Um, they're less likely to be offered aggressive rehabilitation care. And the net results is they have almost a doubling of the stroke severity and the stroke disability as compared to their male counterparts. So there's a, there's a real problem there. And then women also are, are more adversely affected by stroke in that um, they, if their partner has a stroke, they will stay and care for the partner, whereas if a woman has a stroke, it's no offense, guys, but I hate to tell you this, you're much more likely to leave and not be helpful, and that woman has a higher uh, chance of going to a skilled nursing facility rather than being able to return to home. How are you? So um, we see some real health inequities, and we also know that um, the incidence of stroke is going to double by 2020. So um, we kind of can expect a real tsunami. Right now we have about 350,000 stroke survivors living in the community. That will double and be near a million by 2020. So. One other question Yeah, yes, yes and no. So actually, one of the issues around uh, women being offered different types of medical intervention is because women have strokes at different times in their lives than men. So uh, men basically have strokes uh, as they get older. As you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, your stroke risk is doubling each decade. Um, women have stroke at three kind of distinct periods of their lives. One of your highest uh, periods of risk for stroke is when you're pregnant. So young women, and so that can be highly disabling because now you're living with stroke for 50 more years. The second time where women have a very high risk is uh, at the onset of menopause, so in their mid-50s, and so you look quite different there as well. And then lastly, what kind of bites us, and it's a, another good news, bad news, is that um, uh, your risk of stroke increases exponentially with age, and women live longer than men, so we just have more time to have our strokes. <laughs> so, lucky us. Um, and so you see these different time periods, but the two where you see this real, where the women look really different are these early strokes. So to have them in your 30s or 20s, 30s, or your 50s is very unusual. And it's very, um, it's not, I want to say very common, it's not uncommon for a young woman to go to the hospital suffering stroke symptoms and be told she has a migraine, she's hysterical, she needs to rest, and being sent away. Um, and that especially can be the case if it involves the visual system, because that's often a migraine mimic. And so um, there's a lot of uh, education going on right now. This year was uh, the Heart and Stroke Foundation and their stroke report for Canada was very focused on women. So we're trying to work very hard towards understanding um, kind of what these factors are. 
And while we understand kind of these demographic factors, we don't at all understand differences in the neurobiology of recovery between men and women after stroke. Um, and so actually I submitted a CHR grant about two hours ago, <laughs> which will be focused on that topic. <laughs> so uh, if you're on those review panels, it's very important. Give me a good score. Okay. So let me move on. So this is um, one of the ways that we think about recovery from stroke. There's lots of different indices for it. And um, this is a, a study which we've basically um, published about 15 times in different contexts. And basically what it shows is that after stroke, um, the ability to learn is not abolished. That's the good part. So I'll orient you here. This is um, a, a reaction time task where participants are moving to a target. Um, and so what we're looking at is that with learning, people will get faster. So absolute reaction time here is this is RT. So down is faster. And then these are trials of practice. This is two days of practice across the bottom. And we play this little trick in my lab with the way, the things that we ask people to learn. We do this in lots of different ways where we have people move to a series of random targets. And that's what this R is here. And that's what this R is here. So uh, as you move uh, to things that are unpredictable, your motor control can improve so that you move faster. But because they're unpredictable, you can't learn. Um, we then have people move to a series of repeated targets. And here, what they're doing is they're practicing an eight element sequence. So they make a series of movements through space. And what we do is we look at response time across that sequence of movements. And you can see that um, people will become faster at that repeated sequence of movements. That's what's happening here. And then we can introduce a foil, a random target, and they slow way down, a series of random movements, and then they speed back up again when we introduce the, re, the repeated sequence. Um, so that's what I'm showing you here. I have age match <coughs> controls in the uh, solid circles. And in the open circles, these are it's a group of individuals with chronic stroke, so greater than six months post-stroke. And so what we see first is that the, the group with stroke is improving, so they're benefiting from practice. But given the same amount of practice, they never benefit to the same amount, the same degree as age match controls. They don't make as much change. They're always slower. They always make more errors. And that is uh, something that is then, if you look at the overall uh, response times at a retention test, so a delayed retention test uh, at a different time, um, we see that those differences are maintained. And so we've done this experiment in many ways, and you'll see, I'll show you other data today uh, demonstrating it as well, showing that we can give people um, more practice, uh, more rest, we can use exercise, we can use robotics, we can use brain stimulation, and yet we still almost always produce a graph that looks a lot like this one. Um, we can do different tasks. We can look at acute stroke, chronic stroke. And so this is a very fixed feature. And um, as you can tell by this list at the bottom, we've found it a couple times now. So one of the things that we do know about brain plasticity and learning after stroke is that, you know, I already mentioned the brain is highly neuroplastic. It's highly influenced by behavior. So there's no drug you can take to facilitate brain plasticity. Um, it's, it's not quite that simple. There's actually been over 200 drug trials looking at a neuroplasticity drug, and they've all failed. Uh, so the drug companies have kind of given up to a certain extent. Um, there's another one out there right now that's just about to start here in Vancouver where they're actually looking. Um, there's some neuroplastic effects um, with the drug fluoxetine, which is Prozac. And so this may be a, a, it may have a side effect of inducing neuroplasticity. So that's something that's being acutely investigated in individuals with stroke and also in individuals with spinal cord injury. Um, we know that when people do learn after stroke that the dose of practice required for them to learn is very large. And so this is something we've thought about quite a bit in my lab and it kind of frames where we're going. So we call this the dose problem. So this is a, one of the original studies in 1996 published in Science by Randy Nudo, showing um, motor system neuroplasticity after stroke. And this is in a primate model, so they used um, squirrel monkeys for this study. But what uh, Randy showed was that the motor cortex is highly neuroplastic after stroke, but that this dose of practice was very large before it was shown in these animal models. So here, these animals um, made 9,600 retrievals um, before they showed this large amount of neuroplasticity. And what's interesting about this particular study is these animals um, had to make these retrievals that were of food pellets. So this was to feed themselves. So they were highly motivated. 
because they were hungry. Um, and it took uh, almost 10,000 repetitions before we actually saw this uh, plasticity occur. And that's been repeated many times. We're just finishing a CIHR study where we're looking um, at 10,000 repetitions of skilled movement, so a high degree of repetitions. Um, and there have been other studies, for example, in humans. Ours is in humans, and this is another human study looking at 31,000 repetitions. So we have this dose problem, and we think about it in the context of the hospital and of re rehabilitation. Um, there's no hospital in the world that's giving this type of dose of practice to its patients. So that's one place where the medical system is failing. And in fact, we did some work some years ago, and um, the average number of functional movements during a PT or OT rehab session for stroke is 32. And that was, you heard me right, that was three and two, not you know, summed or anything like that, just 32. So we're vastly underdosing what needs to happen in the rehab context. Now, delivering lots of practice, lots of um, uh, practice is, is very expensive. It's very hard. I, as a um, terrible and long-time retired physical therapist, would never want to watch someone do something 10,000 times. Um, I think it would make me tear all my hair out. And so some of the things we've tried to do is understand um, how much dose for which person, um, and are there ways we could get around delivering this amount of dose. Um, so one question that we've had is just how much would we have to give? And you could imagine that giving, doing an experiment where you just gave everyone as much practice as they needed to get to a certain uh, skill level would be kind of a terrible experiment to run. I don't know that your participants would continue to come back for it. So we did some meta-analytic work a few years ago, and this was led by uh, Keith Lose, who was a, a postdoctoral fellow here at UBC uh, with Nikki Hodges. And he worked with myself and a colleague of ours, Catherine Lang, in the US. And we actually were able to model the effect size on recovery from stroke by increasing dose. And so what we found, and this work is published in Stroke, if you uh, care to read it, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, what we show here is the uh, predicted effect size at current doses of rehab. That's in the dashed line. So that's plus zero hours. That's what you'd expect. And by just looking at different effect sizes, we were able to model, well, what would happen if you just added 40 hours of practice on top of that, on top of what we're already giving? And you see that the effect size increases. And the nice thing that's exciting about this data is it increases no matter at what time post-stroke you deliver this extra therapy. So it didn't necessarily have to be at the acute stage, which is time point zero. It could be one year or even two years, even three years post-stroke, and you still saw a fairly substantial benefit. And so you can see that there are, depending on the model, there are these different effects, but all of them positive for increasing the amount of therapy that you might give to a patient. Um, so that really frames kind of where we've gone in my lab. I don't think that we're ever going to see a healthcare system that allows us to give these massive doses of practice in a rehab setting. So I don't think this is going to happen at GF Strong, for example, anytime soon. So the approach we've taken is, is there a way that you could make the brain more receptive to practice? You could prime the brain, make it ready to be more neuroplastic and then pair that with rehabilitation itself and try to look to see if this kind of adjunct therapy approach is a way of getting around this dose problem. And um, so I mentioned we have three lines of research looking at this in my lab. The first is uh, using robotics and thinking about could we allow the robot to help uh, provide extra practice. Um, the second one, which I won't talk about today, um, but we have a large CHR trial underway, looking at this is the use of exercise, so priming doses of exercise. So we use very short, high-intensity bouts of exercise to kind of pre-excite the brain, and then people practice. Um, and so that's underway in the lab. And then the third one that I will talk about is brain stimulation. So could you prime the brain by non-invasively stimulating it and then see what the effect is? So um, I'll start by just talking a little bit about some of our robotic stuff. And it's kind of all early days in this. Um, this is uh, work that we did with uh, Carlo Menon's lab. And he's a professor at Simon Fraser. And the idea here was to have, um, Carlo would like to, and he's working on trying to build wearable robotic devices, whereby um, the stroke <coughs> patient could really engage in a, a large degree of rehabilitation in the home environment rather than having to be in a hospital. So we know that one, hospitals are very expensive. Two, patients would rather be at home. 
And actually, um, patients who are discharged early into a supported home environment uh, show, are shown to have better outcomes um, than those who stay in the hospital for a long period of time. So this is a very um, promising approach. And it, it dovetails with some of the things that the Heart and Stroke Foundation in Canada is trying to implement into cross Canadian care. Um, so the idea here is that you have a, a series of bimanual robots, and so you have a robot on one arm, on the non-stroke arm, that can help drive the stroke arm forward to move with it. So it's a, a training type of um, a movement. And so Carlo had done some work with us consulting on it, just thinking about if we did this in stroke patients, you know, could we um, decrease the um, amount of um, target movement time in a, in a movement task to try to show improvements. And so this is just a case series study that was published, I think, last year in, in Frontiers, where we showed that this approach worked um, with different degrees of success across uh, four different patients. And what was interesting about this is we definitely saw a scaling of this therapy, of the effectiveness of this therapy dependent upon the, the particular severity of the patient. Now, um, and I can't speak to this with any kind of technical expertise, but we, developing these robotics that are wearable, um, it's, a, it's a neat idea. Um, the two problems that we've run into are that um, they are heavy, and so it's very difficult for some of the patients to actually wear them. There's actually three problems now that I think about it. They're hard to put on, so patients need to be able to put them on themselves. And um, the last one is that sometimes when the one arm, uh, this non-stroke arm moves the, um, is moved, and then the untrained arm comes along with it, um, it sets off a spasticity response. And so um, we've had some issues with some of the motors, and you can see that this motor here, if I can get my mousey to come up, there it is. This motor here is shown it's metal, which makes it too heavy. We originally had it as plastic. Um, and uh, I actually was, I don't know if I was fortunate enough, it was interesting, one day I was watching a patient train and the one arm moved and the other arm moved somewhat suddenly and it set off a spasticity response, which if you don't know, that's a, it's an abnormal stretch response in a muscle and that this is a feature some, in some patients after stroke, not all. But in the abruptness of the movement, it set off a spasticity response in the stroke arm and the arm responded by extending very hard, and you just watched all the teeth just shred off the plastic motor. They just like actually flew out into the air. It was like, oh, okay, that, ro that, that arm uh, robotics going in the garbage. So, um, you know, there's some real technical challenges there. So I'm an impatient person. So um, I've uh, moved on, and we are using, I have in my lab a bimanual Ken arm robot. Um, it, this is made by, uh, uh, Beacon Technologies out of uh, Queen's University in London. And um, we have, this is the endpoint uh, robot. And so what this is, is it's, we have uh, two frictionless levers. Um, they move only in plane, which is a little bit of a downside, but it does make things uh, simpler from an experimental design perspective. Um, and um, there are two large motors in the back. So we're able to, and with this particular approach, we can either assist or resist movement. And so we're now running um, a trial that's funded by the Heart and Stroke Foundation that's underway. I think we're eight patients into it, perhaps. Um, where what we're doing is we're looking at uh, bimanual movements in stroke rehabilitation. And we've designed a series of 10 tasks that progress out. And um, all the movements have to be entrained with the two arms together. And um, depending upon the patient's ability, the uh, robot will either help them move, so assist movement, and then as they get better, as they reach a, an accuracy criterion, it starts to resist them back. And so they're making a series of movements, everything from you know um, turning, there's a movement where they balance a ball on a bar between the two arms, they're moving back and forth. Um, there's movements to the side on either way. And so we're actually using this as a rehabilitation intervention. So people are, um, randomized to either get this haptic feedback, so the resist and the assist, or just to make the movements in a non-feedback environment. And we're doing MRI scans before and after, and then looking to see if this changes. Uh, the two different conditions change their functional outcome. So unfortunately, I don't have data to show you on that um, at this moment, because we're just in the middle of it. Um, but I would be very um, open to having, if you want to come over and, and see the robot, feel it, and or watch one of the patients uh, trained, we would be happy to show that to you.
So that's, that's kind of where we are with the bimanual robotics. I'll circle back to them at the end because we do have one study where we put the brainstem and the robot together just because life can't be too complicated. Um, and I'll show you what we found in that one. But I'm going to jump now to our brain simulation work, um, which we've done a, a lot more of over the years. So um, we use a type of brain simulation in my lab called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. And what TMS does is um, by holding a coil over um, the scalp, over the outside of the head, and this, these coils have copper wires running in a circle amongst them, um, we use a figure of eight coil, and so you have the two circles of copper wires, and you have current running rapidly through those. And where they come together, you get a point of electromagnetic uh, induction. And so um, this induces a current that comes out in, a, in the perpendicular area. So if we hold the coil over the head, the current comes out, it passes through the scalp and the skull painlessly, and it actually depolarizes um, neurons that it hits that are perpendicular to it as it comes across. So the way this works is, for example, over the motor cortex is that you can induce this current. It comes across, it hits an interneuron, which then via one synapse will actually activate what are called the cortical spinal tract neurons. So these are the big neurons in your motor area that will send a movement down. So if I was to stimulate over your right motor cortex, and I was over the hand area. So our brains are organized just like our bodies. We have what's called a homunculus. You see that there's a little representation of you. So if I hold this over your hand motor area and I stimulate, we would get a twitch in your hand or your fingers. Um, so this is a way that we can interact with the human brain. Um, it's easiest to do this in the motor cortex because I can make you twitch so I know where I am, but we can do it in the sensory cortex. It's actually a therapeutic for depression. If we simulate the prefrontal cortex out in the front, um, we can give you temporary aphasia, so we can mess up your uh, language system uh, if we wanted to. They, it comes back. Um, and you can also interact with the visual system as well, which is pretty fun. So uh, there's a couple different ways that we can do this. We can use what's called pulsed TMS. So we give single and, and paired pulses. This is a mapping technique, so we can look at how excitable your brain is. So this is something that we do, for example, before and after we have someone exercise in the lab. It's a way of mapping the effect of the exercise intervention. Um, or we can drive repetitive trains of brain simulation into the cortex. And that, depending upon the um, frequency of that simulation, induces an after effect. So I can stimulate uh, at a high frequency. And high frequency in TMS world means faster than 5 hertz. So faster than five pulses per second. What that does is it excites the brain. So you see a, a net increase in the excitability of the cortex. Or we can simulate at less than one hertz, and that is inhibitory TMS. So it gives us a net decrease in cortical excitability. And um, both of those can be interesting approaches in a stroke patient. And we can also, for example, use the inhibitory TMS to induce um, virtual lesions in healthy people. So we can temporarily disrupt a brain area's function and then try to understand what it's doing in the context of a movement or in learning. Um, or in, there's, this is being done quite a bit in things like uh, smoking, secession, gambling, these types of compulsive behaviors. So now you're worried because I'm stimulating people's brains. And it uh, actually turns out the TMS is uh, quite safe. Um, there is a small, small risk of inducing a seizure. Um, but as you see, you see in my next slide, this is a very small risk. Um, and um, this risk is higher at very high rates of stimulation. So we stimulate very, very hard and fast. Um, we increase our risk of seizure. It's also a little bit loud. So those are the two um, main risks of this. Um, this is actually the, the, if you're worried about side effects, this is the side effect consensus paper. And I'll just point out to you that um, single and paired pulse types of stimulation have had no reported uh, seizures uh, associated with them. Low frequency, so you're decreasing cortical excitability, also has no risk of seizure, very rare. And if you get into these high risks, uh, these high frequency TMS, um, your risk of inducing a seizure, even if someone has epilepsy, so has seizure disorder, is about 1.4%. And in healthy patients, it's less than one. So um, it maybe sounds scarier than it is. I should note, too, there's lots of different forms of brain stimulation. There's another one called transcranial direct stimulation, where we actually are passing an electrical current from an anode to a cathode across the brain. 
So that's a, another approach. We've just started playing with that one in my lab, and I, I won't show you any data from it today, but there are other ways out there that um, people are starting to interact electrically with the brain. There's one more called galvanic stimulation, where you actually uh, put in some galvanic noise, and it can interact with the cerebellar function. So as I mentioned, there's lots of things we can do with this, lots of different mapping uh, that we do. But what I'm going to talk mostly to you about today is how we manipulate cortical excitability with brain stimulation. Um, so when we actually um, index what the brain is looking like, we put in a, a single pulse of TMS. I was mentioning that we get a twitch. We measure that twitch by what's called a motor evoke potential. That's what I'm showing you here. So we have a stimulus, a burst of stimulus noise. That's when we delivered it up over the cortex. And then it takes about 30 milliseconds on average for us to see a motor evoke potential in the periphery. Um, that timing um, can, uh, is, is typically highly stere stereotyped, so it it's, doesn't slow down or speed up depending upon the time of day or whether or not you've had caffeine. The one thing that mitigates it is how long your arm is. So mine's a little bit longer. Um, what, what is varied by behavior is the size of this motor evoke potential. So it's amplitude. So if someone more, is more excitable, maybe just exercise, maybe just had a big cup of coffee, um, you'll see that motor book potential get larger. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we've used this as a, a surrogate for stroke. Um, we did a paper a few years ago, gosh, now I'm getting so old, I'm almost 10 years ago, um, where we were interested in understanding the importance of sensory feedback in learning after um, stroke. And the problem that we have in studying this in stroke patients is they, they make a movement, but they have both altered output, they have altered motor output, and they're also getting altered sensory feedback coming back in. And you're never really able to pull those two apart. So what we decided to do was to actually induce in healthy people um, a virtual lesion, a short-term lesion in the sensory cortex of the brain, and then try to understand what would happen to their motor output if they got bad sensory input. So we have this um, fancy, fun device in my lab. It's called BrainSight, um, whereby we, if you were to be in a study, I would, I would first toss you in the MRI, and we would get an, a, an MRI scan of your brain. This is a T1 MRI. We then can input that into BrainSight, and we can stereotaxically um, locate very specific regions in your brain so that we make sure we're stimulating what we think we are, um, that within each session, we're staying in the exact same location, and that if we stimulate you more than one session, we come back to the same location over and over again. And so that's what I'm showing you here. We would uh, we put retroreflective markers on the participant. We put them on a pair of glasses. And then they're also, this is our TMS coil. They're also on our coil. And then this little red guy here is showing you exactly what we're stimulating in the brain. And so that's how we know that we're in the sensory cortex when we did this experiment, since we don't get a twitch. So for this particular study, we, um, we first test sens tested sensation before the experiments. We just tested, could people discriminate when they're feeling two different uh, uh, kind of pinpricks on their hand at the same time? That's a way of testing cutaneous sensation. And we also tested proprioception. So do you know where your arm is in space? If you close your eyes, do you know that your arm is up versus down? Um, and that's what proprioception is. So we showed that, um, this is in our experimental group, that this is a baseline cutaneous sensation that immediately after we stimulate and we inhibit the sensory cortex, we see that sensation gets worse. Um, but the good news is when we do a follow-up, um, a day later it's back to normal. So it's no harm done, uh, permanent harm. Um, this is a sham uh, experiment group. So we have a stimulator that's a, a fake. Um, and so we use that as a control experiment. And we see similar pattern in proprioception. So we make it worse with stimulation, and then it comes back. Um, but the, um, the interesting thing is um, that this is now, these are now, by the way, these are, I think this is 22 young healthy controls. Uh, most of them grad students. And if you're, if you're uh, unlucky enough to be the partner of one of my grad students, them too, um, <laughs> in this particular experiment. So they're young, they're healthy, have normal brains. And if you just look at this particular graph, it looks a lot like that stroke graph I showed you in my third slide, right? So what we have here now is this is our sham group, and they're improving across practice. It's a little bit different task. I'm now showing you an error score, root mean square error, but down is better. This is practice trials. 
So we see this is our no, uh, this is our sham group. So this is just getting better with practice. They're not actually getting any real stimulation. And when we disrupt the sensory cortex, we see that there's this disruption in the ability to take advantage of sensory information and update your movement. And that's true for a repeated sequence that people learn and also a random sequence that they can't learn. These, by the way, the way this experiment runs is you would get stimulation, we'd inhibit your cortex, and you practice. Boom, right together. This data now, this is 24 hours later. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is we've given no stimulation. So this is now what did you learn in the absence of me inhibiting your cortex. It's a no stimulation retention test. And you see that these, um, that the experiment group is significantly worse for both the repeated and the random sequence. So it shows us that this, the sensation is quite important. And it just shows the importance of this technology, these, this experimental brain stimulation approach that we can take to try to start to answer kind of these very basic neuroscience questions around motor learning. Um, this slide over here shows that the effects were lost. So when we come back a week later, then there are no lasting <coughs> repercussions of the, of the inhibition. So it has been transient. Um, OK, so then we basically wanted to run the same type of experiment in people with stroke. And that's what we did here. Now, except for we did it, we did the opposite. So for stroke, we didn't want to inhibit um, their sensory cortex. We want to excite it. So we want them to now take more advantage of sensory information coming in. So in this study, we have individuals with stroke. It's the exact same approach. Um, and except for the fact that now we're exciting the sensory cortex immediately before they practice something new. Um, this is the uh, same type of graph. So we see that at baseline, our two groups are not different. And this is, these are all stroke patients. We have a group that gets the excitatory stimulation there in the dark circles, and a group that gets uh, the fake stimulation there um, in the open ones. So we see no difference at baseline. Across practice, there's Patients who we excite the cortex in advance, we excite the sensory cortex in advance, improve. And we see it in no TMS retention that that's a significant improvement and it has persisted. So we've actually significantly changed their learning by pre-exciting the sensory cortex. What's exciting about these people is that we see this change in a number of domains. So I showed you the response time data already, but we also see that the patients who receive the stimulation, they um, achieve faster peak velocity, so they're moving faster. And we see differences in the path that they take to hit the targets. Now, I have this annoying data. My, patient, my uh, uh, students at least think it's annoying. Annoying habit of I like to see individual patient data. So this is um, my slide about how to lie with statistics. So I just showed you that this was a great intervention and everyone learned, and that was fantastic. Um, and on average, that's quite true. So here is our 5 hertz stimulation group, and here's our sham group. And you can see that if you look at the magnitude of change from baseline to retention, the stimulation group did the best. Um, however, if you look at now, these are the individual amounts of change on a participant level. Um, and down is better because they're moving faster. You can see that I have these two people who are really driving the effect. They did great. Uh, these two people who did pretty well, this person we made worse. Uh, these guys didn't really change. This one's okay. Um, so you see there's a real mixed response. And this is something I'll circle back to at the end. So this is a real feature um, of all of our brain stimulation groups. We see a very highly varied pattern um, of response. Now we published this paper in 2014. In 2014, I was still trying to ignore variability. That was my approach. Um, we were just averaging things and hoping for the best. And if you collect enough data, the variability doesn't matter. And we've really changed the way we're thinking about that in my lab now. Now we're really interested in the variability and our kind of what we're moving towards is what are the biomarkers that can explain this variability to us? Because clearly, these two people should get stimulation. These are the ones that are benefiting from this therapy. Um, this one, probably not. We probably need to find something else for that person. And the big question is why? Yeah, hi, Sid. <laughs> Um, well, that's a good question. So some of us are better motor learners than others. We affectionately call them the motor morons in my lab. Yes, I understand, but you wouldn't expect them to get worse. Some of it's attentional. They're just phoning it in. They get excited at the beginning. They make their practice. And then as we 
practice on, it's not as much fun. And, um, and um, you know, those were really my best explanations, and they're kind of unsatisfying. So we're not entirely sure, but the sham's not doing anything. It just makes a noise. It does absolutely nothing. It could be. And so um, it, we're, not, we're honestly not sure. We're, uh, this is, I'll go, I'm going to go sideways off my talk. This is not in the talk at all, but one of the things that we've been looking at that may explain some of this variability is the excitability pattern of these interneurons in the motor cortex. And um, we see that interneuron excitability may differ across um, people and across uh, complicated versus simple sequences of movement. And so we're, we're, we backed up to some very basic studies trying to understand if we can relate these patterns of excitability to, these, to this. And so we're not sure, but we're trying to see if there's a neurobiological rationale or if it's simply just attentional and they got bored and they just weren't trying. And you never know, especially with reaction time experiments, you have to be so focused on them if that might be the case. They started the worst, yeah. Now we do control for that because we just calculate change scores. So it doesn't matter if you start here or you start here as long as you change. Um, I should have said that early on. But, but they certainly do. I mean, it, it's obviously, for this experiment at least, it's good to start out bad. Yeah. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, so the stuff we're doing now is really looking at baseline and, and doing some data, trying to look at different biomarkers and then say, can I predict that you'll make this much change versus this much? Um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit how we're doing that. It, it, it is also possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It. It. Yeah. Then you don't have to. It's quite boring. Um, the other bit that we don't have in here that is part of our biomarker model we're building is. Um, is cognitive capacity, and a lot of these patients too, the, the other kind of dirty secret around stroke is that um, we, we pretend that everyone's had a first time stroke, and that may be the case. You may have had your first time clinical stroke, but when we look very carefully and we have some new imaging sequences that enable this, and we, we look at um, the whole brain, we can now see strokes down to the size of a millimeter, and many stroke brains have hundreds of these. And in the past, we just simply couldn't map them. And we now know that these are a major source of vascular dementia. And so you're looking at these highly complicated patients who may have these high degrees of these secondary micro lesions on top of their other strokes. Um, so usually your big stroke is not your first stroke. Had little ones coming up to it. And so that may also play into, can you even pay attention? Maybe you just assume we don't have the capacity. So those are other things that we're building into the model now that we can index them. So it's a, it's a highly complicated picture. Mm. Can you contextualize um, some of the responses that you're gathering? Can you do this on average? Um, for example, a response time of you know 1.6 versus 1.2 seconds, or a distance of this or that. What is the what is the impact of that? And if, again, when you're looking at the individual results, you can see that there's quite a bit of overlap. Yeah. Yeah, let me, if, with your permission, I think I can do this best and it will also save time if I jump to another slide. If you don't mind, this one. I jumped way ahead. But I, I think it will help. So it's an excellent question, like who cares if you go 20 milliseconds faster? I mean, I do, if it makes my statistics and I can publish this paper in a high-tier journal, right? But do you really actually care? Um, so we, we've done basically the same experiments again. And the important thing that we are looking at in this particular experiment is a little bit different approach to simulation. It doesn't really matter. But we wanted to know now, does that change in motor learning? Does that 20 milliseconds, what does it relate to in terms of your ability to be functional in the real world? And when we stimulate the brain, we pre-stimulate the brain, do we see people who improve in both? And that's what this is showing. So we were actually looking at two different simulation sites here motor cortex and sensory cortex, but that, that doesn't really matter here. But what we show here is now this is improvement on a, the Wolf motor function test. So this means you're more functional in your life, like you can drink from your water bottle. And across the bottom now is change with motor learning. And so I've divided this into quartiles, um, and they've received this, in this experiment, these are stroke patients again, they've had five days where we stimulate the brain and then they practice. So this is the group that you want to be in. So this 
quartile up here, these are people who showed positive learning, so they're 20 milliseconds faster, but they also significantly improved their arm function. And so not only did that um, mean that they were quicker, but it meant that they could, it, it had a real world meaning. And so when we do that, we see that about 60% um, of our patients fall into this quartile. Um, but we have another group of patients over here who maybe improve their function, is just one or two, improve their motor function a little bit. These are the people who maybe just benefited from getting out of the house. Um, and, but we didn't see that they actually learned the task. And then this is the group of concern over here. So we have really two patients who um, we either didn't really help or we have this one person who we actually full out made worse. So they, their function has decreased and they didn't learn. So that, the big question is, if you, is there something that would tell us who's in which of those quartiles? Um, that's the big, the big issue there that we're trying to chase down now in terms of the, the biomarker question and trying to understand who goes where. We have some different ideas about what might help us explain that. Um, we've done some modeling and it turns out that it's, it's a, it seems to be a pretty complicated thing where we're injecting um, a number of different brain markers and then stroke recovery markers, age, how many microlesions, kind of trying to build up this model of variance as we go. Um, okay, so at least just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge on from here just because I wanna give time for more questions and Lisa's waving at me. Um, for this second study, which we called in HIP, this is a CHR study we finished a few years ago, two years ago. Um, this is what the data looked like all in all. So we had, in this particular study, we had 28 patients, small study. Um, we had 17 people who we categorized as responders. So they improved their function with this brain simulation. And we had 11 who did it. So 50, 40% don't respond. Um, but the question is then what, what is explaining that response uh, status? And how do we figure out for whom? Because for the 17 people, this, this is the right therapy. And so I think that in terms of thinking about, you know, the, you're designing for people. That's really what we're trying to do in the lab. We're trying to think about stroke recovery as you would, for example, cancer care. So um, you know, if you and I both have breast cancer, the likelihood is not that we're gonna get the exact same intervention. So cancer oncology has done a very good job of these understanding these individualized pathways, individualized sources um, of both the disease itself and then individualized responses. And that's really what we're trying to do here is develop biomarkers that will help us understand, um, can we find the 17 of you who should get the brain stimulation, make sure you get it, and then figure out what on earth do we do with the 11 that don't respond? Because there we're, maybe, maybe you need something else altogether, robotics, I'm not even sure what stem cells, gene therapy, I'm not sure where you go. But this is kind of the, where we're heading in that. So we think that TMS will have a future in rehabilitation, but we, we have to figure out for whom. Um, and maybe I should just stop there so that we have a chance for questions. I have, I have one more study I was gonna show you, but I won't. Um, so I appreciate your time and any other questions that I can try to answer for you. Try being the operative word. <laughs> So I had a, a question on that long-term actual use of robots as opposed to research. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the time is healthcare cost. Yeah. So do you actually envision a point where that would be cheaper than uh, specifically training less skilled so you don't need a full-time, you don't need a fully qualified physiotherapist right. specifically. Yeah. The only thing you're doing is you're trying to exercise. Yeah. I, I do think that that's coming, and I think it's coming for a couple reasons. I think in Canada it's really important because we don't have enough physiotherapists and we don't have them in the right place. So it's super if you have a stroke in Vancouver, but if you have one in a 100 mile house, you're in big trouble because there's no one up there to help you with your rehab. So there's, I think that's probably, for our remote and rural population, it, will be a, it could be a significant advantage. Um, I, I do think that they will be helpful. I don't necessarily people see, think that we'll see people walking around wearing assistive robots, not any time soon. It'd be great, but I don't think that's gonna happen really soon. But I, I do think it may be a bridge, one that your therapist sets you up and then you can continue to practice, either at home or in the rehab setting, and then you can slowly transition out of it. That's kind of the model. 
that I think people are heading for. But they need to be a lot cheaper yeah. uh, and, and accessible. Like the modern of iron lungs that when I was a kid, yeah. people had, but people fundraised. Right. No individual Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's true. I, it would be very rare that people could, I mean, the one in my lab, which is a fairly cheap one, is about $250,000. So um, you know you can you can move up from there. There's a lot of movement though, and, and I, I'm sure you've heard from Mike. Where did he go um, about this? Where you know can we start to translate these into cheaper things, into into tablets or into these? You know, print Carlo Menon's vision would be you know you digitally print these, and they're relatively cheap, and that way when your patient destroys it, you're kind of like oh, well, we'll print another one. Um, so that's kind of the way I think people are trying to go. The, the problem is we don't quite know how to implement rehab on them yet. And that's really what my grant's quite basic. And just what do we manipulate? Do we, do we push or do we pull? And when? We don't, we don't know the answers to that yet. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't, right? And so I'm just wondering how different it is when you're when you're when you're a chemist if you're trying to uh, manipulate neuroplasticity or trying to get it versus you know that maybe a less informed approach and you're just trying to um, you're training without quite knowing the person. Yeah, that's a good point. So the literature is pretty good in stroke rehab that the guiding therapies don't yeah, work. Right. Do the same and that's idea. The and so that's where these Newer robotics are being used more to start off to get the idea of the task in line with ours, and we very rapidly fade off that guidance until the person's moving independently. And then we even move it into like a, an exercise, like now it's a resistance training even. But I think that, that you, um, at least in stroke, have to move off of that. The, the largest problem we see with the robotics in stroke is that um, it's, people get a lot better at the robot, but it, it, it rarely transfers to the real world. Um, so that's been the major impediment into moving that into clinical care is that we can't seem to move it once you pass the robot to actually, you know, being able to pick up your water bottle. Um, yeah. So there's always a transfer problem. Yeah. And so that's, uh, that's something that a lot of people are thinking hard about in terms of the context of these remote communities. Can we design something that's robotically informed but that is m much more real world than it's tasked? And, than what I have in my lab, for example. Um, so moving towards that, that type of an approach. Yeah, Mike, you probably have some comments on this. I'm acutely uncomfortable talking in front of you guys about robotics, I just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the issue you brought up 30 years ago. But we were doing stuff with early robots on this, and the one of our most interesting studies uh, outcomes was that we had single or single-armed and by manual <coughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And um, obviously, 10,000 reps of the same thing is probably not going to yield a whole lot. I, just as an aside, our, our study where we're doing 10,000 reps, um, people are doing the same task, but it's extremely different every time. So that's our, it's a semi-immersive virtual reality task where you have to catch an asteroid um, and throw it into the sun, or else the world explodes and we all die. So they get a score for how many lives they've saved, and it's quite loud. And, but it's in, it's in open space, and the asteroid's unpredictable in its location. And so the idea is to have stroke patients reaching outside of their uh, comfort zone to catch, and then they have to control and throw this thing. So they have to 
release it as well, which is part of the movement. But I, I agree, you, you can't really um, do the same thing over and over again. I don't know that anyone's categorized very carefully um, that effect. We do have, and I'm, I wanted to show this, I'm sorry, I've jumped around a bit. I hate it when people do that. But um, we have actually created an algorithm we use in my lab um, that we, actually this is, this is accepted. I need to update the slide, obviously. But um, what we do is we are able to exponentially model every movement done by an individual and um, calculate a, a rate of change. And that rate of change, in turn, we've just shown recently in a paper, predicts the numbers of trials before someone asymptotes. So rather than doing 10,000 of one, you would basically, on an individual patient uh, level, say, oh, you're going to need 400 and I'm going to need 652. And then, then you can adjust based upon this algorithm, the individualized doses. Um, it's also a way where we can say this person's responding, they're changing at a certain rate, and then maybe another person's not. So we're trying to put some mathematics on this to be a little bit smarter about this, these dose things, which hasn't really been done before. Um, so that, that's kind of exciting. And then you can weight that math with different biomarkers. The other thing I should mention that's cool about the, the robotics that's being done out of UCF Calgary, um, Sean Duclos is the investigator there, but they've designed a whole bunch of robotic tasks that they're using as actually biomarkers. So rather than scan or stimulate the brain, he says if you can move you know, this much at this speed, that's a marker that you should have this particular intervention. Um, and he's built in some cognitive tasks into that as well, which comes back to some of the other questions we were talking about. So, trying to model both motor response and cognitive capacity with robotics doing particular movements. And that may be a very, um, that may actually be the most exciting things that comes out of all this robotic work and stroke, is again, just capturing who that patient is a little bit better. Thank you.